They come to worship in freedom. The moment I have opportunity, I came here. In flight from religious persecution. From what I heard of America, there's a land of opportunity and you could be whoever you are. And they have always come since America's earliest beginnings. America treated us like no European country treated us. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Amish and Mennonites, Hasidic Jews, Tibetans. They left behind a world that didn't want them for the dangers and complexities of freedom. America gave so much freedom that people could go any way, and they were afraid of that freedom will be the death of our identity. Next, Destination America. The Earth is the Lord's. They have come from all over the world. Their faces have changed, not their reasons. In flight from poverty, persecution, war. Drawn by the shimmering promise of America. In the year 2000, Suring fled Tibet, where the Chinese communists denied her the right to practice Buddhism freely. She keeps her last name secret. She is afraid for family who remain behind. So I wanted to talk with you about what happened to you in Tibet. It would be useful if we could learn a little bit more about this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about some of your experience when you were under arrest by the Chinese authorities? When you came to New York, were you having any nightmares, uh, difficulty sleeping? Before Soaring came to America, she had never left Tibet. But when she was 22, she was forced to abandon everything she knew and loved. Soaring is part of a long line of men and women persecuted for their religious beliefs who have taken refuge in America ever since the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Their numbers have been small, but they have always come, bearing witness to the idea of America as a haven for immigrants in search of religious freedom. From the Mennonites and Amish fleeing Switzerland and Germany in the 18th century, to the Hasidic Jews fleeing Eastern Europe after World War II, to the thousands of Tibetans who come today. Then 
Ne çapapı? Jamil şişe kanı mı? Zorla çöpler geçen bu çiçeği jamil şişe de var. Da şişe kanı koni de ağa çeydi acıyor. Ben batıran çengi tu, ben loya kete de nila mı batan gitu mu? Dile sonda. Kavacı na lumba çişürün da lumba no da lanı kanı çeydi sana. Lumba şa apama şa andi mandur andu ches. Before the last half of the 20th century, Tibetans seldom left their sky-high kingdom perched on a plateau in the Himalayas. Like Suring, most lived close to the land, isolated by geography and choice from the rest of the world. There were few cars, telephones, or paved roads. Buddhism and everyday life were woven together into a seamless web of daily rituals punctuated by seasonal festivals. It is very religious influenced culture. Almost like you know you see the with the Jewish people the Judaism in the, went into the culture, like how they eat, what they work, what they do, very similar to that. In the Tibetans, the Buddhism really went into very much in culture, and uh, particularly every day life. When Tsuring was a little girl, like all Tibetans, she learned to revere the spiritual leader, the Buddha incarnate, the Dalai Lama. Under Chinese rule, displaying the Dalai Lama's picture was forbidden. When her mother protested, she paid with her life. <laughs> Buddhism has been practiced for nearly 1,500 years in Tibet and even the Chinese communists haven't been able to stamp it out. In 1950, when the Chinese army invaded, the communists vowed to modernize the country and save Tibetans from a life of grinding poverty. I remember the day when they came in. Marching, carrying the flag. The Chinese said, we're here to help you, to protect your religion. That's what they said. The communists soon revealed their true intentions. In eastern Tibet, they began to close down monasteries, redistribute land, and imprison and torture monks and nuns. But the Tibetans fought back. By the middle of the 1950s, the communists were putting down a full-scale rebellion. In 1959, they overran the holy city of Lhasa, the Tibetan capital, forcing the Tibetan rebels to surrender. The Dalai Lama fled, and tens of thousands of Tibetans followed him. 
and everybody was going. Just put on the shoe and left. I went up to the mountain and across the mountain after mountain. The Himalayan mountains, they are very high mountains. There's a tremendous amount of snow. A lot of Tibetans are trying to climb the mountain up. They couldn't climb. The mules die, horses die, yaks die, people fell down. Finally, I crossed the Tibetan border exactly at the midnight, came to the Indian territory. And that is my final goodbye to my homeland. I was 19 then. I never saw my parents again. I lost everything, and not even a and not even a ball, not even a begging ball with me. So I become penniless refuge. The revolt, the Chinese said, was futile, like an egg being thrown off a cliff. By the early 1960s, Thousands of Tibetans were in flight. Never had so many Tibetans left the country. Decades before Tsuring escaped, Tibetans were already making their way to America. The moment I have opportunity, I came here, and I'm very happy to be in the new home. I'm really very proud to be an American citizen. My admiration to the United States and America is not American dollar. It is the liberty and the freedom and the individual rights. That is the hope you get. And that is the admiration. That's why I took a shelter here, all the way from Tibet. When spring arrives in parts of Brooklyn, the streets take on the festive air of a fall holiday, Halloween. But no one here is celebrating All Saints Day. Far from it. It is Purim, the most raucous festival in the yearly cycle of Jewish holidays, marked by religious Jews everywhere. Here in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, it is celebrated by some of the most strictly orthodox of all Jews, the Hasidim. The Hasidic community in the United States is not much more than a half century old. Their Purim costumes may be downright American, but these are a people profoundly connected to the customs of the villages of Eastern Europe, where Hasidism was born some 300 years ago. This community is intent on recreating the lifestyle of Europe. They dressed the way they did in Eastern Europe back in the 1700s and the 1800s. They wear beards and long black coats. They all generally wear a peos, which are uh, side locks, based on a biblical commandment not to cut the sides of your head. They insist on the modesty of the dress of their daughters and their wives. The kids here speak Yiddish, the same way that their great-grandparents did and their grandparents did. These traditions come from Eastern Europe. And at the same time, 
they to see them are open to modern technology. So they are recreating Europe with cell phones. In here. Cute. Joshua Halberstam descends from a long line of Hasidic Rebbes. His grandfather was one of the first Hasidic spiritual leaders in Brooklyn. Purim always was a very popular holiday in Europe as well. And they've continued that tradition and then some here in the United States because religious freedom has allowed them to expand their religious life in a way that was impossible back in Eastern Europe. But beyond that is a whole value system which they bring with them as well. And notions of charity are um, fundamental and people are always asking money for other people. This is a religious community which began under the mystical movement of Hasidism which began in the 1700s. Just ask the guild. Have you changed? Have you changed? Have you changed? Yeah, I find it. I'm back. I'm getting paid. I'm getting paid. I'm getting paid. Love you. All right, do well. He was just asking for charity. He came over to me and said, there's a poor family that needs money. So I was bantering with him about how much money he wanted. He whipped that to the I got a five, you got some change on him. He says, you want three back or two back? I said, no, I want four back. And so, you can get very poor standing out here on this corner. For centuries, the celebration of Purim took on the flavors of Eastern Europe. At the end of the 19th century, five million Jews lived in Tsarist Russia, two million more in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, most of them in small villages called shtetls. For observant Jews, there was no activity more important than the study of the Torah, the ancient Jewish holy book. No authority greater than that of the rabbi. Hasidism offered something more. Hasidism sought to teach Jews to serve God through joy. It was a call back to the mystical traditions in Judaism, away from the sort of rigid rabbinical traditions which focused primarily only on learning. Hasidic Jews lived alongside other Jews, nourishing their own values and traditions. They did not look to the scholarship of a rabbi for answers to their questions. Instead, they turned to the intuitive teachings of a Rebbe, a wise, charismatic holy man. We felt that this was a holy man, a truthful man, a righteous person. You would go through them rather for advice, for inspiration, for, for, for um, blessing. They believed that this man, because he was such a righteous man, he has some kind of in. So <laughs> there's an in with, with God. Yes. And through him, you could ask. A hotline. <laughs> hotline, something like. The shtetls were islands of Jewish faith in a sea of Christian believers. Everywhere, Jewish life was hemmed in by laws and customs imposed by the Christian world. Jews suffered a variety of harassments, from exorbitant taxes to physical violence. In Poland before the war, where Jew lived a little out of the Jewish community, he passed by the, the non-Jewish schools, and it very, very often, almost daily, the other boys used to hit them their heads, throwing down their heads from the street. It was, it was anti-Semitism. Our relationship was uh, more or less hostile. Oppressed by injustice and poverty, 
Eastern European Jews looked toward America as Die Goldene Medina, the Golden Land. In the 40 years between 1880 and 1920, more than two million Jews came to America, nearly one-third of the population in Eastern Europe. the largest migration of Jews ever. But the Hasidim stayed behind. For them, America was far from Die Goldene Medina. Instead, they spoke of Die Trefene Medina, the impure land. They were afraid of America, afraid of what keeps us. What keeps us is well, let's say the Orthodox, at least. I don't know, the people who would like to, to mix or intermarry or mix. It is a death sentence. It's a death sentence because you lose your identity as a person, as a Jew. That is me, and if you take this away, it's like you are taking away my good name, my very name, my very existence. And America gave, America with its wonderful freedom, gave so much freedom that people could go anyway. And they were afraid of that freedom will be the death of our identity. All across Eastern Europe, Hasidic Rebbes warned of the dangers of America. <laughs> Not many Hasidic Jews strayed far from home. Joshua Halberstam's grandfather, the Rebbe of Bardiev, was one of the exceptions. My grandfather left Poland to come here because although he was a Hasidic Rebbe, there was a lot of competition. There were a lot of Hasidic Rebbes. They all have to make a living, and making a living became increasingly difficult. Hasidic Jews were generally very poor, and he had to support a family. And there was not a lot of money around. So he packed up and took his youngest son with him and said, I'm going to try the great golden land of America to make my way and see if I can make some money, which, of course, I will send back. So he comes to America, and he finds, of course, there are no Hasidim here. This is in the early 1930s. After a year or two, he starts worrying about the education of his son. And so he goes back. And my father used to tell me how, how strange it was, after having spent some time in the United States, to go back to the small shtetl in Poland, which he found very primitive in a lot of ways. You know, he's this sophisticated American already, who, um, although he's a Hasidic kid, still knows about the world in a way that people back home didn't. My grandfather, of course, still has to make a living. It doesn't go so well in Poland, so he comes back to the United States. I would imagine that if my grandfather would have been able to make it in Poland, he would have stayed. Immigration to America saved the Rebbe of Bardiev and his son, Joshua's father. Adolf Hitler was rising to power. We ha heard already of Adolf Hitler, of a Hitler. These children that were deriding us had a way that rhymed in Polish. Uh, Jew, Jew, Hitler is following you. Oh, it rhymes in, in English as well. November 9th, 1938. Crystal knocked, the night of broken glass. Hitler had already stripped Jews of their civil rights. Now he began destroying their shops, their homes, and synagogues. 30,000 Jews were sent to concentration camps. For frightened Jews all across Europe, there was only one escape, immigration. But most Americans were indifferent to the plight of European Jews. While thousands were admitted, a rigid quota system and other restrictions barred many thousands more. All over Europe, 
Jews were clamoring for entry to America. But in the Hasidic communities of the shtetls, in spite of the danger, life went on as it had for centuries. Our grandfathers were born there, and this is our country. We felt that as long as I can live here and have bread on my table, I will live here and continue with, my, with the way of my living. We still hoped, you know, people live on hope. But when the Nazis stormed into Poland in 1939, it was the beginning of the end. Two years later, in the summer of 1941, the Germans began the mass murder of Jews in eastern Poland and Russia. The final solution, the systematic plan to annihilate every European Jew, had begun. As soon as they came in, we knew that we are finished. They were so organized, it is unbelievable. It's unbelievable that they didn't finish us in one year. In 1942, the Nazis began sending Jews crowded in boxcars to death camps with names like Treblinka, Belzets, Auschwitz. When my parents got married in 1942, I think there were 1,500 people at the wedding in America. But most of the family that day would probably be at the gas chambers. When Auschwitz was churning at its highest, 10,000 people were being killed every single day. My brother was 22 years old when he went to Auschwitz. He was strong, he was young, and he did not survive. My five brothers and sisters, my father, mother, and my two grandfathers were killed. And I survived. In 1945, the war was over, but millions of refugees wandered across Europe. Among them were 200,000 Jews with no place to go. One of the places the Hasidim were not gonna go was back home because their homes no longer existed. Everything's been destroyed. They're not wanted there, and there would be no point in trying to recreate their lives back in Poland or in places in Eastern Europe, although they've been there for many, many, many centuries. I want to go to Israel. I only wanted to go to Israel and be among my own people. I didn't want to know anybody. I didn't want to know any nation. I only want to go to Israel. But boatloads of Jewish refugees were turned away from the Holy Land by British soldiers. Great Britain, which controlled the Middle Eastern territory, feared upsetting the Arab population. For many Jews, America was their only hope, their last refuge. From what I heard of America, there's a land of opportunity, and you could be whoever you are. And the first anniversary of the finish of the war, we arrived in America, the 8th of May, 1946. Very few people could say that they, they claimed that they came so early to America. In 1946, the American Hasidic community was tiny, 
just a handful of recent immigrants clinging to their Eastern European roots. They feared that Hasidism would die in America. Instead, Hasidism has not only survived, it has prospered. Today, more Hasidic Jews make their home in America than anywhere else in the world. Most of them are survivors of the Holocaust, their children and their children's children. No one predicted that Hasidim would ever make it here in the United States. And it took years for them to realize that they could actually live the way they wanted to and not feel like outsiders. My father, for example, was um, adamant about having a huge flag on July 4th outside of his window. And he would tell me, you're in America, you don't understand what this means. And he would tell me again and again how I'm taking for granted the kind of liberties that for him were so cherished. You can choose what you want here, but one of the choices is not to become part of the mass culture. And that's what Hasidim are choosing every day as they live out their lives here in the United States. Values turn out to be strong enough to be able to survive the attractions of a materialist world in the United States. And they are many. But Hasidim really fundamentally believe that the values that sustain them back in Europe are the ones that can sustain them here. After Suring escaped from Tibet, her children fled too. But Dolma and Cherub have been, as yet, unable to join their mother in America. While they wait to be reunited with her, they live in India. Someone <laughs> Like many Tibetan girls and boys in India, Dalma and Sherab live in a boarding school for exiled children. Desperate to preserve their religion and culture, Tibetans sometimes send their children over the mountains without them to the thriving Tibetan refugee community in Dharamsala. Once an outpost of the British Empire, Dharamsala is now home to the Dalai Lama and the seat of the Tibetan government in exile. Over the last two decades, many refugees have been monks or nuns, forced to flee Tibet after years in prison for participating in demonstrations against Chinese rule.
in Tibet, politics, culture, and religion are so intimately bound together, it is nearly impossible to separate them. Although Suring now lives in America, she never wanted to leave her children or Tibet. But even as a girl, she feared that one day she might share the fate of others in her family. Not only her mother, but two of her grandparents were tortured and killed. When Suring was 16, her father was arrested and imprisoned for five years. Two years later, she too was arrested, tortured, and then released. <laughs> When she was 22, Suring fled across the mountains like the thousands of Tibetans who had fled the Chinese before her. Two years later, Dalma and Sherab followed, escaping with their father, who now works hundreds of miles away in Nepal. <laughs> Nearly 400 years ago, alongside the Limat River in Zurich, Switzerland, Hans Landis was beheaded for refusing to forsake his religious convictions. A leader of an early Protestant religious sect known as the Anabaptists, Landis defied the Swiss Reformed Church and paid with his life, the last in a long line of Anabaptist martyrs. On June 26, 2004, in the Grossmünster, Zurich's great cathedral, the church asked forgiveness. Die Gnade unseres Herrn Jesus Christus sei mit euch allen. Amen. Namens der evangelisch reformierten Landeskirche des Kantons Zürich heiße ich Sie ganz herzlich willkommen im Besonderen aus den USA. Wir möchten miteinander einen Tag der Begegnung, der Versöhnung, ich werde dort auch nochmals in einem Bekenntnis zur historischen Schuld meiner Kirche stehen. Das ist etwas, was mir auch sehr nahe gibt, geht und ich bin sehr dankbar, bin Gott sehr dankbar, dass wir diese Zeichen jetzt setzen dürfen. The persecution of the Anabaptists in 16th and 17th century Switzerland ended in the exile of thousands of men, women, and children, and a journey to America in search of religious freedom.
Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, home to tens of thousands of descendants of Switzerland's Anabaptists, the Amish and the Mennonites. The Amish and the Mennonites are Anabaptists who live simply and in community. They selectively reject the modern world. They can ride in a car. Some will use tractors. They can sense what new practices would erode their community. The whole Anabaptist movement was born out of a sense of taking the Sermon on the Mount personally and taking it, you would say, literally. Every Sunday, Amish and Mennonites gather to worship, bound by their piety and the shared memory of their history. Their hymns tell stories of persecution and faith. One hymn tells the tale of the Anabaptist leader, Hans Landis. Hans Landis was born around 1544 in Hirzel, a small town near the southern shore of Lake Zurich, into a world torn apart by religious strife between Catholics and Protestants, where cities like Zurich defied the Pope and set up their own reformed church, closely allied to the local government. Hans Landis rejected the Swiss reformed church. He and others like him all over Europe insisted that the church must be free of government control. Sie waren für den Staat eine Art Revolutionäre, die eigene Gemeinden bilden, die eigentlich auch staatlich äh, sich ausschlossen und äh, die staatlichen Pflichten nicht mehr erfüllen wollten. We will pay our taxes. We will respect our government. We want no other government than you, but we will obey God rather than man at any cost. Sie haben diesen Eid auf die staatlichen Symbole und auf die staatlichen äh, Behörden verweigert. Und das wurde in dieser Zeit als ein todeswürdiges äh, Verbrechen angesehen. Anabaptists were made to suffer for their faith. A story illustrated in The Martyr's Mirror, a harrowing Anabaptist chronicle of their history. They tell the story of individual cases of people who were executed for their faith. You could either be burnt by the Catholics or beheaded by the Protestants. You were burnt for heresy you were beheaded or drowned for civil unrest, often after torture. In the face of certain punishment, Hans Landis would secretly baptize and marry members of his congregation deep in the forests outside Zurich. When the mayor of Zurich ordered him to stop spreading the cancerous weed of his spiritual fellowship, he refused. Landis was captured and imprisoned in the Wellenberg, a forbidding tower that once stood in the center of the river that flows through Zurich. They spent hours and hours and hours threatening him and asking him to dissolve his community or to leave, he wouldn't do any of that. He would continuously quote Psalm 24, 
he would say, the earth is the Lord's. It's not yours. Hans Landis was the last of the Anabaptist martyrs. By 1650, the town fathers had driven the Anabaptists out of Zurich. Along with Anabaptists from all across Switzerland, they fled to Germany, where they splintered into two groups, the Amish and the Mennonites. For decades, they continued to suffer persecution and oppression. Then, in 1681, an English Quaker named William Penn created a colony in America. Pennsylvania, or Penn's Woods, was to be a holy experiment, a colony based on religious tolerance. The first Mennonites arrived in 1683. They send the word back, it's great over here. Total freedom of religion, no taxes, wonderful soil, humongous trees. They said, the reports that you hear over there about opportunity in the New World are not exaggerated. In fact, it's better than that. And so three shiploads come in 1717. Mennonites and Amish were part of a wave of some 100,000 Germans who came to America in the 18th century. The first descendants from Hans Landis's family arrived in 1717. Here ruit Johann Landis. Here rests John Landis. Er ist gestorben im Jahr 1727. He died in the year 1727, 2nd of December. Uh, at the age of 63 years, nine months, and several days. The first recorded Landis death in Lancaster County. Across three centuries, Landis descendants have lived and died in Lancaster County. Today, there's a Landis Valley, a Landis Road, and dozens of Landis's riddled the phone book. John Ruth is himself a Landis. America treated us like no European country treated us. They always found a way to tolerate us. Like anybody else, you were a citizen. It was hard to believe that. It was unprecedented opportunity, materially, as well as spiritually. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Mit der Enthüllung der Gedenktafel für den Täufer wollen wir heute ein Zeichen der Versöhnung setzen. Der Nachricht der
What is this? Hand. 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 Yeah. What about this? Finger. Finger. Okay. What about this? Wrist. 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 Here's a hard one. As part of Bellevue NYU Hospital's program for survivors of torture, Suring is learning English. What about this? Today, she makes her home in New York City, where she earns a living cleaning offices. Okay, you know all the parts of the head? One day, she hopes to become an American citizen. Sering got here the way that most Tibetans get here, with false documents. Then, once she got here, she claimed asylum. You have to prove that you are a victim of past persecution or you can prove that you have a reasonable fear of future persecution. Uh, now, in Sering's case, we actually had both of those. <laughs> With the assistance of Human Rights First, Sering found a lawyer to help win her asylum. Then she petitioned the Immigration Services Bureau of Homeland Security to allow her husband and children to join her in America. The problem is you can petition, and someday, they will be here. But when that day will come, I don't know. I think since September 11th, everything has slowed down. My dust Amala, it was so sweet of you to send those beautiful gift and the sweet letter uh, made us so happy. It's been four years since the last time we saw you. We wonder when we will see you again and live with you. We miss you every day. Your only daughters, Doma and Shirab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.